So we arrive in our relationships because of the unconscious agenda. We rely, we arrive in our relationships with these two adaptations. So uh, one reason we have to adapt is because there are childhood needs that weren't addressed by, by our caregivers which is a given because they aren't perfect so that it's impossible for them to always know what you need, how you need it and when you need it and to address all of those needs in that way. It's not possible for them to do that. So we've got unmet childhood needs and the adaptation is either we become a small square, a minimizer or a big jumbler, right? So the one person, the square says, okay, it's okay, I don't have any needs, I don't have any feelings, um, I'll just uh, withdraw, isolate myself um, in any way I can and look after myself. On the other hand, the jumbler says, well, I'll make a noise, I'll do whatever I have to do to get you close to me, to keep you connected to me, to make sure that you see me. So those are the two adaptations regarding our unmet childhood needs. Uh, what, in regards to socialization, we adapt in another way, right? What we, what we do is we suppress certain parts of ourselves. And by doing that, we end up creating uh, a false self. And behind all of that is the missing self. which really means we su suppress, avoid, let go of parts of ourselves and those parts go missing. They represent the missing self because of socialization, because of the messages we get from caregivers, society, religion, wherever we get those messages from. Tell us this, this is acceptable, that is un unacceptable. It's okay if you do this, not okay if you do that. That's what I covered last week. So. We suppress certain parts and that energy that's supposed to go, for example, towards our emotions, we suppress our emotions. So, of course, you can see the squares tend to do this. Um, that, that energy goes to another part. So maybe you overdevelop your thinking parts. Okay, but this is another way to kind of plot these different aspects of how we adapt. So, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the very first little block here is uh, where we we have our social self or presentational self, it's called. So what we want and how we want people to see us, we show them that. So we know that's part of who we are. But also others can see, okay, that's who you are. That's what you're putting out there to uh, present in the world in an acceptable way. Okay. But there are other parts as well. So uh, we also have, <coughs> excuse me, let me just get some water. We also have this other specific parts that others know about they can see but we we don't know we don't see it and this has two aspects to it there's the denied self so what's the denied self that's all the traits that we experienced as negative from our caregivers but now we've embodied those traits as well so if you had a very cold unavailable mother you incorporate that and now you are a cold and unavailable partner but it's too painful to admit that it's too painful to see that to be associated with something that caused you so much pain so we deny it others can see it we can't see it um we we often fight. So when our partners point out that you are being, in the example I gave, cold, unavailable, we we fight back. We criticize. We defend 
uh, in a very ag aggressive way, either by or through the square withdrawing, being cold, keeping quiet for days, still stay where it's cold in Afrikaans, or by attacking, causing huge scenes and fights. Uh, that's the deny itself. So negative traits that we have that others can see, but we, we can't see. We don't realize we have them. The second part of this is the disowned self. And this is the opposite. So there's positive traits that we admire in other people. Others can see that we have those traits, but we've disowned them. We don't want to associate with that. So um, a very practical example will be that you look at people that's artistic and creative and say, wow, you know, I, I can never be like that. But other people will go, you, you are. Look at how creative you are in terms of your home or when you draw, it seems so natural or anything like that. But you disown it. So you, you, um, you cause that part of yourself to go missing um, by disowning that trait. So if you want to know uh, and start discovering, well, what's your denied or disowned self? The question you can ask is, what do you absolutely hate in other people? What just ticks you off immediately? So maybe you say it's someone that's very arrogant, right? That's, that's a, a negative trait. You hate it. That's probably a denied part of you. Or somebody that's confident. So I'm giving it a negative and positive spin. Somebody that's confident, you look at that and you kind of admire it because you've disowned that part of yourself. You say, no, no, I'm, I'm not really confident and things like, like that. Okay, so those you can look for yours by looking at things that you really hate in other people or things that you um, really admire in other people. That will give you a clue of an area we, where you can start exploring these things. All right, let's move on. So, well, yeah, let me add another thing. In each of these three areas, right? Let me mark it like this. This one, this one, and this one. Each of these three areas includes the contrasexual self, meaning certain traits that because of your context, your society is associated with a certain gender that, but you are actually, uh, you have that, you, you have those traits. So for example, um, being aggressive is something that's commonly associated with men, but you're a woman and you have that. So now you, you also block off those parts of yourself because it's unacceptable for a woman to be aggressive. She will be labeled as a bitch, for example, and putting it very crass because that's exactly what happens. Or a male, a man that's uh, into uh, traditionally feminine things. Maybe a male that uh, does ballet or enjoys ballet. You know, that will also be... Um, blocked and form part of the missing self. So all three of these have, have a contrasexual self that's included in that. And even though there's been massive shifts around those typical, stereotypical um, labels on men and women, there's also, you know, even that flip side creates labels. So men will now disown their aggressive self because it's unacceptable to society. So I will not be accepted if I'm a man and I show any kind of aggression or confidence. So you can see how uh, complex and intricate this becomes. And that is why I don't want anyone, any one of you to get caught up in all the theory and detail, but rather be just be curious and learn about how you will show up in a relationship. So if you are in a relationship right now, you will be able to see that already. But if you are not, 
maybe you look back at your past relationships and you'll see some of these symptoms there or you can be on the lookout for them when you enter a relationship another thing that i want to mention here is <coughs> your um the relationship that you enter into that will trigger the unconscious agenda so in a certain way many of the things will not be accessible to you you will not be aware of them you will not be able to see or talk about them when you are not in a relationship because there's no triggers there's no partner that represents your parents in a certain way that can trigger the adaptations right the adaptations that we've mentioned here so if you're not in a relationship no one can trigger this any part of this either part of this but once you are in a relationship that gets triggered so um, what makes that a bit tricky you're like okay i was with that person and then i was this way but now i'm not and, and now i'm myself again but that's the social and presentational self right this that others know and you know about that that part this one but it will go back or will come back when you are in a relationship because then those things get triggered right your brain system gets goes on high alert because of that uh, maybe i'll say a little bit more about that in a moment let me <coughs> first continue with this right so there's parts that others don't know about but you know about so this that part is called your hoops your hidden self That's where you secretly do things or act out things. You go underground with them. You know that that's part of who you are, but others don't know because the social and presentational self that you put out there um, does not give any hint about that, but you know about it. So you hide that part of yourself. Uh, you live a double life in a certain way. There's certain, um, a very innocent side of this might be guilty pleasures that you hide from other people. So maybe, um, you enjoy a certain kind of music um, and you're afraid within your context that people will judge you for liking that so you hide that that's a very uh, simple example but there might be other things that you are thinking about right now that you know that's part of who you are that's something i do i feel i think about but no one else knows about that that's the hidden self and then lastly we come to this uh, bottom right corner where you don't know and others don't know about it and that we call your lost self self so part of you that is so uh, deeply suppressed and denied and disowned and hidden that you don't even realize that it's there and other people don't realize it either right so uh, how do you how do you grow back into all of these different parts well it's all about understanding that uh, the energies that I spoke about last week, energies meaning the way we engage the world, our emotions, thinking, senses and action, our bodies, movement, uh, learning to access all of that. So for me, for example, um, my, my wife has a lot of access to her emotions. So when I met her, I saw this person that was so alive and joyful and felt so intensely. Um, and I was drawn to that because my unconscious agenda went, oh, that there is the lost part of me. I found it. Now I can feel whole with this person again. But that's exactly the part that I criticized later on. Too much emotion. Why? Because I learned that emotion was and is dangerous. So I criticized those parts of her. So, which means let me uh, talk about this a little bit when it comes to a relationship and relationships dyna dynamics you pick someone that's uh, in the imago training is your imago meaning an image of your caretakers positive and especially the negative traits why because you want someone like that to address your needs 
you want to show those uh, missing parts of you to someone like that right if if like in my example earlier if you are cold and your parents was uh, or mother was cold and withdrawn right you look for someone you pick someone that will also be cold and withdrawn because you want a person like that to be able to give you the love you need so let me use the the brain model that dan siegel uses so if you uh, take your hand like this put your thumb inside there and fold your fingers across it this this represents a model of the brain right so right here at the back it's like the reptile brain that's really about survival that's where the the fight and flight and freeze comes from that's where the square and jumbler operates that part of your brain does not have any idea about time or a specific specific person so if your partner behaves the same way that your parents did it senses that danger and you will go into your adaptations square jumbler or any part of the missing self you will go into those adaptations right because of this that system does not gauge time or know what's what's real or what's not it's all in the imagination because it's about survival but if your partner manages through dialogue and you know personal work and development and you understanding your own needs to address some of those needs accept some of those missing parts of you the shadow side it's also called uh, that part of your brain also doesn't know if it's past or present so that heals those things and you don't no longer have to operate from those adaptations right so in front of that reptile brain is a limbic system so this back part is the reptile brain of course reptiles have that very instinctual very reactive and the limbic system that's most mammals have that so that so there's some emotion there that they can sense but then we've got this brain that falls the brain stem with the um the neocortex the frontal lobe and the top part of the brain that falls that is the is the part that becomes inaccessible when you are triggered right so you don't have access to any of this you have access to the reptile brain maybe the limbic system the emotional brain but you don't have access to the other part of your brain that allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes that allows you to communicate clearly that allows you to be present and become aware of what's going on and allows you to be intentional right so let me add something real quickly here what i mean is <clears throat> if if uh, we quickly go back to the relationship cycle right romantic love the power struggle uh, coping where you're just surviving really you don't you avoid certain uh, topics and then the moment when you have to make a choice what's the choice the choice is about becoming aware so what this these classes aims to do is just help with the awareness help with the awareness of all the dynamics that's going on within a relationship why you choose a partner why they can trigger you in the way they do why you struggle to commit to a relationship why it goes well in the beginning for maybe the first three months to two years and then suddenly it seems like this person has changed so much so it's all about becoming aware of those things so that's what this aims to do and once you are, are are aware that's when you you have to start applying intention meaning intentionally doing things in a different way intentionally understanding yourself so you can communicate to your partner all of those things come into play which creates that love true love real love not romantic love where you are on drugs but love that's about oh okay i can accept the things you do for me to address these needs i can communicate to you and give to you what you need that dynamic but that happens when you are intentional otherwise it's just this trigger upon trigger from this this brain the the reptile brain that's just about survival and you go straight to that place 
right? So that when you are in the power struggle or coping and even romantic love. So let's, let's once again just highlight this. That part of the process is you know, unconscious, reactive. So if you do this, I feel this way. If you do that, I think this. If you do this or say this, I do that. It's just reactive and symbiotic. Biotic, which means, you know, we're, we're enmeshed. You are responsible for how I feel. I'm responsible for how you feel. Instead of uh, conscious. So this is where the awareness and the intention comes in. Also, intention comes in with responding. I'm able to respond to a trigger. I'm able to respond to my partner's needs. I'm able to respond by voicing my needs and differentiate it. Okay, I'm not going to write all of that out there. Differentiated meaning accepting that we are different and that's okay. That's okay. That's the part of the process we want to move into. Okay. Any questions so far? Please put uh, questions in the chat. I'm going to give a little pause here. Let's just give a minute or so if there are any questions. If you don't have questions, uh, I invite you to answer those questions, right? What really irritates you about other people? Because that can indicate a denied part of yourself. What really, uh, what do you really admire, admire in other people? That may indicate a disowned part of yourself. No, no questions at all? All right. Then I'm moving on. <clears throat> I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, oh, let me go back here first. Sorry. Um, so when you become aware that there's, I'm really operating from this, right? That's the Imago. Realizing that you pick someone that oh, um, will wound you in the same way uh, and or deliver to you the healing that you need by growing themselves give you things that you need that's very hard for them to do right so uh, the, the little saying goes like this you had it so meaning those parts of yourself you had it you lost it you look for it you find it you fall in love with it, you commit to it, you marry it, and then you want to kill it, right? Because then, as I explained about my emotional world, then the emotions become dangerous because that limbic system, that reptile brain gets triggered, says, oh no, emotions are bad. And then you criticize your partner. But you also project. So some of those negative traits, um, you project onto your partner, meaning you are the one that's very impatient, but you project that onto your partner and then you criticize it over there, right? You are the one that's, that's uh, overdeveloped in terms of your thinking, so you always want to be right and, and win, but now you criticize your partner whenever they do something that indicates that they have a point or a, an opinion about something. Right, so you project and criticize. So criticism lies here. And also, if you have a denied part, meaning a negative trait that you have, and your partner points it out, you will also criticize. Right? You will attack. Then the last part is you provoke. So maybe your partner isn't impatient like your parents were but because you need to reenact those things for you to heal you provoke your partner until they become impatient and then you know how to act and how to feel um, we my wife and i had a very real experience around this in the first six months of our marriage so both of us um, had fathers that um, struggled with alcoholism 
uh, her father would uh, come home at four and start drinking for every day and start drinking and it become very aggressive violent threatening with guns and all those things and uh, they are past that now just um, by the way but that's the way she grew up so so what would happen when when it we were married at four o'clock she would start picking a fight she would become aggressive and uh, criticizing and poking and poking until we have a fight because she's been programmed for so long to um, survive she's been programmed for so long that during that time that's when i have to survive and act a certain way stand up for myself be protective uh, uh, towards my mother and things like that um, so now when when we were married now she's got someone close to her right that triggers those things that uh, reminds her okay i'm i i'm i'm not a heavy drinker I've, I've never been um, generally not an aggressive person uh, so nothing about what was familiar for her was present so she kept provoking and provoking and provoking until I became irritated and we had a fight then she would instantly relax and become super calm and of course I was very confused but uh, we went to see someone um, very soon after that and that's what we discovered what was going on and of course all of us have little things like that that we uh, provoke in our partners and that's called transference so you transfer those negative traits or things onto your partner or you uh, provoke your partner to create a certain way so that you know how to act even though the way you act is not the way you want to be or you who you think you really are now you can act that way and you can feel uh, safe and confident within that all right still no questions please if you have one put it in the chat also not only questions but comments if there's any big discovery for you a realization please also put that in the chat okay now um, what I want to also spend some time on doing today is uh, having been in this field of relationships and, and working with many couples over the years, I, I realized there's some massive gaps, in my opinion, around the way therapy approaches relationships and relationship therapy. Because uh, <clears throat> I'll explain more of that now, but, but here's what happened for me so my wife and I we really did a lot of work so if you've read my my little book about responsibility I share some of those things in there that we structured into our relationship like um, uh, weekly dialogues working through books together uh, to learn and understand these things understanding shame and hurt and all of those things but also when I trained to become a, an imago relationship therapist I um, included my wife in some of those trainings so 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 she joined me so we learned a lot and we were really diligent about applying those things because we were already aware that we brought a lot of baggage with us to our relationship because of the alcoholism specifically but later on also understanding um, the dynamics we had with our mothers trying to be a surrogate spouse for them replacing the things that our fathers could not give for them we played a certain role so we knew that we brought a lot of baggage into it so that's why we worked so hard but then about f five years ago four years ago i can't remember um we had this argument just before i had to go into the office to to my office uh, it was a different office not this one to see a couple to facilitate communication and help them deal with conflict and we were arguing arguing around and around this certain point as most of you have experienced i can't remember what, what what it was about and in the end i said okay i have to go now i have clients but it was way too early to see my clients because i'm in the square mode so i just wanted to get away 
But as I was driving away, I, I felt like a fraud, a fake, like a hypocrite, because I just had this argument with my wife. Now I'm going to facilitate communication. That did not sit well with me. And, and it really confused me because, like I said, we did a lot of work including work with Greta that you met in the second session. How is it possible that we can still have this kind of fight? Doesn't didn't make sense to me. And so I drove to the Burt parking lot near the spa, sat in my car, felt very sorry for myself and very confused. And I, I just thought if that's what happens to us, I work with this on a daily basis. My wife did all this. We invested a lot of time and energy and money into learning these things. If that still happens, what what chance does uh, do any couple have? What chance do they have to to succeed? None. So it became a, a major thing for me to to understand. Okay, if if we really apply this and this is how well it works, which is not very well, it did help a lot, but we still had those fights. Then either I have to create something very different or I have to stop doing what I'm doing. So I phoned my wife, told her, I'm sorry for the argument. That's not who I want to be. She immediately also apologized. And we both knew we'd have a dialogue in the Imago way mirroring and understanding one another and it will be fine but i said to her that's not good enough for me anymore why have this and then have the conversation anyway we know it's going to be fine why have all of this negative anger and emotion around it so i said to her my commitment to you is that i from now on when we disagree i will be very happy deeply happy i'll focus on being that and she was like, what do you mean? And I told her, well, if I feel like that, I can be present. I can listen to you. I can um, understand you because of this whole brain thing, right? My, my neocortex frontal lobe stays online so I can engage. If I feel like that, if I feel danger or threatened, I'm operating from this little reptile brain at the back. Um, and she's like, okay, that makes sense. And I told her, I'm, I'm going to make this major shift in our approach. I'm going to work hard on um, shifting my approach as well as a therapist and as a coach. And if, if it doesn't work, then I'm not going to stop doing the work I do because it seemed cruel to me to put people through this hard work that stir up all these things and it's not really effective. So... I created what I now call the tree of clarity. In the beginning, I call it the belief system model, but it's really about understanding what the underlying belief system is from which you operate in your relationship. It's understanding that if you feel certain emotions, you will, you know, react, you'll be symbiotic and it will all come from the unconscious. But if you can, become aware of what are the things that I believe about love, about myself, about connection, about my partner. How does that make me feel? Uh, if I understand that, then I can rewrite this whole belief system. So this is not a place to go deeply into that model, but I want to just highlight certain aspects of it. And then, um, well, let me show you. Let me show you. So before I, I talk about this, so traditional therapy, TT, it's really about what's wrong, what's the problem, and what's the problem, and how do we fix it? How to fix it? So it'll be, okay, let's go to the childhood, let's go to the past, figure out what the problem is, what's wrong, and then fix it. And there's some value in becoming aware of this. That's why I'm, I've talked about all these things in this, uh, these classes up to now. It's, it's great and powerful to understand, ah, that's what's going on. 
but your relationship isn't a problem. It's not something that's wrong. It's not something that needs fixing. So in Imago, even they, they say that the relationship is not a problem to be solved, but an adventure to live. But even in Imago therapy, there's a lot of focus on the negative stuff. A lot of focus on what's missing, uh, conflict, uh, what's behind the conflict and things like that. And I think what that creates is it keeps on triggering this stress response, the survival instinct that triggers the square or the jumbler. So most couples therapy isn't successful. And I'd say for myself about, um, let's say 40%, 30, 40% of couples that start the process, stop the process. Uh, for different reasons so i've been working hard on how can i help couples stay in the process because the process will help them a lot but the traditional process will only take them that you know so far as i explained that my wife and i experienced so it's really about how do you shift the focus from uh, the negative the problem the fixing um, the issues the baggage Right, because you, you can't change the past. Um, and even when your partner helps you heal, the focus is on what's wrong. All right, that's the focus. And it's not about ignoring those things, but it's about how do I create a state of mind that I can show up in those situations and be present. Right, like, like I explained uh, about my epiphany in the board spot of parking lot. Um, how do I create that? So let me now quickly go back to this. The RAS, what's the RAS? It's the reticular activating system in your brain. Now, this is a part of your brain that basically makes sure that whatever you deem important, it points out to you, it shows you, right? So. The example I always use is if, you, uh, if you're in the market for a new car, you do, do some research, um, may you, maybe you're looking for a, 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 a whatever, a new um, polo, a white polo, whatever it is. Research and all of those things, you check it out. The next day when you are on the road, you see them everywhere. They stand out. And I know polo is very common, so <laughs> that plays a role. But even if you pick a very uncommon car, your brain will point out to you, there's one, there's one, there's one. Suddenly you see them everywhere, where just the previous day you'd hardly noticed them. That's the RAS working, right? So if your relationship focuses on what's wrong, right, what do... Uh, what do you need to change in this relationship? Pointing at your partner. And what's wrong with me? Um, your brain will help you find things related to that. It'll show you, oh, there, that's what's wrong. Uh, um, this is why you, you do this, right? This is why your partner is like that. It'll point out all those things to you, which means the focus will be on problems, the negative, and fixing, especially fixing the relationship or fixing your partner. Not growth and healing, won't be on that. So what is negative sentiment override? So the Gottman Institute um, did a lot of research on couples by observing couples in what they call the love lab. It's like a makeshift apartment where they invite couples to stay for a weekend and act as normally as possible while they monitor them. So you can read the book, Making Marriage Work by the Gottmans, very, very um, helpful. Um, also has its problems, in my opinion, uh, gaps that, that I think is there um, that needs to be addressed and what I'm trying to address in my approach. So what is negative sentiment override? Basically, it means that for every negative interaction with your partner, you need five positive ones. If you have five positive interactions or um, thoughts about your partner, then you override one negative one, basically. And how do you do that? Using the RAS, 
right? So I say use the RAS, tell it where you want to focus so you can see positive things, healthy things going on, celebrate it in your partner, appreciate it in your partner, tell your partner about those things. Um, because the negative things will be there. But if you keep on looking for them, you'll keep on finding them. And because we are triggered, right, to go into our adaptations, meaning square or jumbler or the missing cell features, because of that, it's it does not help or allow us to show up the way we want to at all okay so what i what i say you should rather ask is who am i married to if you are married if you are in a relationship you can ask the same question who am i in a relationship with if you are single at the moment, think about the people you had a relationship with. Who was that person? What, what um, were they really like? All right, so this is about helping your brain, the RAS programming, programming it by saying, who is this person and how can I focus on who she is in my case, my wife? And celebrate those things. Differentiation comes into play here. She's different from me. So I'm not measuring her in ter terms of how I think sh she should be or how I am. I'm looking at her and saying, who are you? How, how do you engage with life? What are your defaults? And when she acts that way, I'm not surprised. Um, we had our uh, daughter's birthday party this weekend and my wife likes to um, go into a lot of detail and prep and effort which has helped me a lot to heal around not being important, not having birthday parties. Um, but she also um, prepares way in advance, way in advance. We've had lots of laughs around this so she'll, we'll have friends coming over and she'll prepare like uh, a hot meal two hours before they arrive and it's ready and it gets cold and, and things like that. Um, but she, she wants to be very prepared and in control. So she communicated to me, listen, Saturday morning, I want three hours. So from seven o'clock, the party starts at 10, three hours where I don't want to be distracted. So I want you to be fully in control of the kids, do whatever you have to do, but I want to uh, be able to do all the preparation for the party to, so we are ready. And she did a lot of, she went through a lot of effort to make it look nice and beautiful and fun. I know this, she knows what's happened in the past. Um, she wants to do all of this um, effort. She got, wants to go through all of the effort. I feel it's unnecessary. They still they're gonna play on the trampoline and anyway. So let's let's do something, but this is too much, too much. Um, so I block her and we end up having an argument or there would be tension. But now, who am I married to? I'm married to someone that likes to go into all of those details. She likes beauty. She's an artist. So even a birthday party for a four-year-old turning five must be beautiful it must be beautiful so she's also the kind of person that when someone comes to visit their their bed must be beautiful their room must be beautiful so she'll do she'll go through a lot of trouble to make sure that happens so that's a, a very practical example that's who i married so when she behaves in this way i shouldn't be surprised but what happens to me all of this effort makes me feel uncomfortable because I'm not used to it because of my story from childhood. So I can be, oh, okay, that's what's going on. It's got nothing to do with her. I'm just a little triggered, but I don't have to focus on, oh, I'm triggered. What happened? Why did I don't have to stay there? I can just focus on how amazing it is that she does all of do. She does all of these things for our children, goes through all of the effort to create this. And it changes my state, my state of mind, my emotional state by focusing on that. And I can just enjoy 
uh, the fact that she is like that. So that question, who am I married to, is very powerful. It also creates curiosity about who your partner is and the way that they are. Okay. The next question, so instead of asking what's wrong with you or me or us, you know, who am I married to? Be curious. But also, who am I? How do I show up in this relationship? What kind of partner do I want to be in this relationship for my partner? Focus on that. And this is where you can use the, the missing self information, including uh, the adaptation around uh, childhood needs. So this is who I am. This is what I bring to the relationship. All of this is my stuff. I can communicate about it. I can ask my wife for certain things. But if she fails to address it in the way I want or need, that's okay. Because that's just part of who I am. But also, there's certain elements that I bring to the relationship that I can focus on that's positive. Um, so I, I'm very good at building systems. Uh, I'm very good at strategic thinking. So that's who I am and I bring that to the relationship. Now we understand that we have a certain dynamic and we can celebrate and use that in our relationship to create the kind of relationship we want, right? <clears throat> that's the first thing I wanna share. Just ask those questions rather than what's wrong, okay? And <clears throat> it might also be that the answers you find, so who am I married to? Maybe you find, geez, the person I'm married to is really not uh, healthy. It's not, it's not someone that's good for me, right? And then you have to ask more difficult questions. Why do you stay in a marriage like that? Is it because of socialization saying, if you get divorced, you're a very bad person and X, Y, Z? Why do you stay in the relationship? So it just allows you to ask different questions and what's wrong. Um, like with alcoholics, the partner, you know, the enabler, the person that stays with that alcoholic, they enable the whole situation. They stay in those dynamics over and over again. It's always about that's the, the person is the problem, not me. I've got nothing to work on to grow. So they don't. But if they do, that's the kind of person that can have a different influence on their partner. Or that's the person that says, okay, I need to get out of this marriage or this relationship. And they take that leap. And sometimes it's necessary to challenge people when they do uh, sessions or couples work. If I see that they're not really showing, they're not showing up, they kind of in it, but they're not that ambivalence, which comes from the attachment phase, that ambivalence, I need to challenge that person. So you need to make a choice, either full, fully commit to the process or fully commit to get out of the relationship. Otherwise, you won't be happy, your partner won't be happy, and you won't be able to create the relationship that you want. Um, some comments here. Let me just read this before I share the last little bit. I am thinking that I have hidden parts of myself in order to not overshadow an older sibling. Yes, yes, yes. That happens uh, quite often when, when you've got a sibling that, I don't know if it's the case with you, but um, that maybe, maybe academically they're not that strong, but you are now. Your parents don't want to make a big fuss about this and make them feel bad. So they rather just, oh, that's, they get a, D or a C and like, wow, that's great, fantastic. You get an A and the A plus and like, good, that's fine. Yes, that's exactly something to pay attention to. So that's, uh, I'd say that's maybe also part of the um, disowned part that you kind of, you don't want to show that otherwise you might hurt people that you care for. Um, then I imagine this is also part of the reason why we suddenly start seeing ads for toothpaste after having a conversation about toothpaste with our partner. <laughs> uh, no, that's Google listening in and, and, and uh, showing you ad advertisements related to the topic. It's much more scary than that. Um, okay, those are, those are the comments so far. 
uh, let me end off with, with this. Uh, when my son was uh, about, how old was he? He was uh, one, one and a half years old. Uh, we went on a tour up in Africa, all the way to Malawi and back. It was, I think it took 47 days, 46, on this trip. And at the end of the trip, my wife and I felt so connected and close. Um, and the reason is very simple. We spend a lot of time together. So in romantic love phase, you go through a lot of effort to spend time together. And when you spend time together, you are presenting your best self. That doesn't mean that it's fake or unreal. It just means you're hiding some of your quirks and things. You know, if they say they like blue, you're like, I've always loved blue. Because you're in love. But that also shows, to me, it shows how powerful the shift in focus can be. So you can still shift that focus on how wonderful this person is. You can still shift the focus on how do I want to show up, right? The question, who am I married to? Who am I? Those questions. Um, you can still focus on that and show up that way, even though you're not in the romantic love phase. Because if you shift that focus, it determines your thought patterns, your emotions, and then the way that you respond to your partner. Uh, if they may be... Um, drop the ball in your relationship for some reason they're not who they need to be in the relationship or when they show up differently from who you are you can see and acknowledge that so time together is crucial it's crucial you spend that time in the romantic love phase focusing on what's beautiful and positive in your partner and also focusing on how you show up how beautifully and positively you can show up so um, because we had a GPS for our trip that tracked the moving time, we ended up spending 120 hours in that bucket together while driving, having conversations, listening to audiobooks uh, and, and chatting through those things. So what we now know about our marriage is if we become edgy and irritated with one another first thing is address the time how can we spend more time together because the more time we spend together the better things go between us why because if we are so busy with life and other things both of us start feeling lonely and invisible and our needs aren't met and we become resentful and i can list a whole bunch of things that you probably have experienced as well but if we spend time together focused on us, not just logistics, which I wrote about in um, my other book, The Ten Habits of Happy Relationships or Happy Couples, um, that uh, that time together is really an investment, right? Which I talk about in the time management webinar as well, for those of you on, on the quest and other programs. Um, we invest time into our relationship. And the return on, on investment there is massive because we are both able to show up more often uh, for longer as a better version of ourselves by focusing on that. So time is huge. Typically, couples spend very, very little time together because of how busy li their lives are, because of all the things happening day by day, day after day very little time that we really spend together it's just talking about admin and logistics most of the time so that means brings me back to this you have to be intentional about creating time together you have to be intentional about play right being playful and doing fun things together whatever that is build into that build into that time invest that time set aside that time fight for that time with your partner okay i'm going to leave you there uh, there's lots of stuff that i i, I want to share about the model i'm developing and, and the structures i want to build into my program for couples but that time is a big thing how to help couples set aside that time to invest in their relationship 
Um, thank you for being here for uh, all these sessions. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, and feel free to send me questions if you have any. So uh, keep, um, keep your eye on your emails uh, in October because I'll let you know when I launch uh, the next series uh, around relationships. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.